with the zeros. Where there's, where there's something and where there is nothing. And the relationship between information and the space in between the data. So, all right. Now, here's a more, here's a more rigid example. So, let's take the, the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words from Napoleon, I believe. And so the capital A has the asking value of 65. And then in the binary conversion, this is, this is what it is. And so how do you want to know that the 65 is this? For people that don't know binary, it's, a, it's a based on a base 2 number system instead of base 10. So it's not like a counting system. All of these are, all of these spots here are powers of 2. So the only numbers that are possible are 1s or 0s. Uh, so in a computer this makes sense because it either has electricity or it doesn't have electricity. That's how it decides everything. So if each one of these is a power of 2, and this is 2 to the power of 0, 2 to the power of 1, on and on, this 1 here is 2 to the 0 power times 1, so that's a 1. And then this one over here, it's like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This is a 6, 2 to the 6, right? So that's 64, and you add up to 64 and the 1, and you get 65. Is that clear? <laughs> yeah. The name tags all say, hi, my name is. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, this is Medea. Oh, and I wrote down the first sentence for those that care. Uh, oh, how I wish that ship, the Argo, had never sailed off to the land of Calchis, or Colchis. I can't, I can't be sure. Uh, so here, so it starts with an O, capital O. Here's the binary string. Here's how it all breaks down for these ones. 1, 2, 4, 8, 64, because those are the bits that are marked. Adds up to 79. And then I plot it right here. And you'll notice these papers, they start 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way around to 24. So these mark time in hours of the day. So I start on the one line, like you would sequentially if you're reading. And I start this way, and I move around like this when I plot it. So it, it, go, it doesn't, I don't mark like this, which I think a lot of people think I would do that. But I don't. I go sequentially. And you see a piece upstairs where I've started one, so you can go. Okay, so that's Medea. This is a, then a few examples. This is Don Quixote, uh, Gulliver's, Gulliver's Travels. Let's see, how many more do I have, please? Virginia Woolf is ever on the wall. How much of Gulliver's Travels would be on there? It's about 500 characters and punctuation in the spaces. It's really not very much. I mean, if you wanted to do the whole thing, it would. <laughs> it would be ridiculous. And this is War and Peace. And one of the things I, I became really interested in, and because uh, these are very meditative, and they take a long time, and I sit and I think about, you know, why the hell am I doing this? And I think that I get really excited about how the thing is completely representational. And I love the idea. I, I just, it, it really drives me crazy when people try to pigeonhole me and they say, oh, you're an abstract artist. Well, no, I'm not. That's representational. That's readable. I mean, that's an algorithm. It, it's completely readable. You just can't read it. <laughs> you know? I, it. It's representational. So I started thinking about that a whole lot and uh, got really excited about information. Uh, and uh, let me just move on from there. And, uh, okay, so then I, then I got, uh, I started looking at other papers. So those chart papers, those round ones, it turns out that they're for monitoring temperature, temperature and pressure changes in manufacturing cold rooms, or like to monitor your jelly and make sure it doesn't stay the temperature all the way that 24 hour period, so that if it craps out at some point, the little arrow will show you exactly what time of the day on the paper uh, where you know that something went wrong. So then I said, well, what other papers are there? So uh, what other things are we still doing in analog that, you know, these days that aren't, haven't been converted? And so then I ran across uh, ECG papers, so electrocardiograms. We still have people doing this, and you can get these papers online pretty easily, big rolls of this stuff, I and mean, they just go forever. Uh, so this is the first one I did, and it has these three rows, the paper does. So then I started telling, well, what do we do? 
wrote this, and then I turn it this way, and then this couldn't read this. Like, what am I going to do with that? Thought about doing music on it. Nothing really fit. So then I thought, well, I'm going to compare things. You know, like people say, oh, they read a book and they think, oh, it's the next greatest thing. You know, or the politician will, you know, make you believe it. That you know, like they'll give you the value of the words. You totally, totally believe that this is better than that over there. So I thought. Well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at the value of words, but I'm going to look at the numeric value instead. So on this one, comparative religion, we've got the first book uh, of the Gospel of Matthew. It's the first book of the um, New Testament, I think. Yes. And then uh, Martin Luther, uh, 95, uh, 94, you can read it. And then this Principia Discordia, which is a kind of a funky American religion developed in the 70s, I think, and it's all about chaos theory, how the world is nothing but chaos. And they actually have a, a text, that they, a religious text, and it's completely chaotic. So all what I did is I just took the, I, up and down here, you've got just, uh, the same as before, the, the text is converted into binary strings, and I plot it out in columns, and then right up here, and I'll show you a detail in another one, there's numbers. And then at the end, I add up all the numbers and I get a big fat grand total. That way I can say in this argument, um, Martin Luther wins. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Big Bang Theory. You can see the you can see the numbers better on this one. So we got uh, Big Bang Theory. So we got Genesis and Darwin, and then uh, a letter concerning toleration is John Locke's. Um, he, he wrote this letter to, to the arguing for separation of church and state. So hey, there, aren't there seven now vertically rather than eight? Yeah, but you don't actually need the first one. The, the, you don't need that last bit. Because okay. there's only uh, really 127 characters, and that last bit mm -hmm. gives you 128. Okay. So you don't really need it. So I use it for a number instead. But okay. you're the first person to see that. <laughs> so one. Oh, oh, um, gosh. Uh, oh, I remember this one. John Locke won this one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, and a lot of these things are political, too. So this one is uh, the same, in the same year we had the Health Care Act passed, we had the Hate Crimes Prevention Act passed, and then we did this crazy uh, Senate Bill 1070 out in Arizona. All in the same, like, just like six months period. It was, uh, so I find that illegible. Legible, illegible. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. I mean, I can read it, but it doesn't make sense. It doesn't, I can't understand that. Uh, Pacta sub servanda, that which is a, uh, um, a legal term, which means uh, agreements must be kept loosely. And so here I've got the Boy Scout Promise, Girl Scout Promise, which are very different. If you haven't read these in a while, you can have to take a look at them because they're a little freaky. They're very gender role bias, it's a little strange. And then we've got down here at the bottom is President Obama promising human rights for all Americans and citizens everywhere. So promises must be kept. I guess I was thinking to myself, well, we wouldn't have to guarantee women's rights if we didn't have to take that stupid oath that the boys don't have to take. <laughs> but I'm not sure. That might makes right. Uh, this is Bush arguing to go into Iraq and arguing to go into Afghanistan, and then this is Aesop's fable for the lion's share. <laughs> where he decides he's going to share with all of his, with the jackal and all of the other generals below, and he says, um, but what does he say? Uh, the, smart, the first share will go to the smartest, and that's me. And the second will go to the most powerful, and, and that's me. And the third one will go to the bravest. And that's me. And as for the last portion, I dare anyone to touch it. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so then after this, I started thinking about the, the, the spin of the message. You know, if you're, if you're creating meaning for people, and it's going to be valuable meaning, and you want them to think it's valuable, uh, you have to contextualize things. You've got to couch it some way that they want to eat that pill and say, oh yeah, that's yummy. So I started, uh, I, actually Anna had brought this book in, or into the house, and she was doing some research, and I was uh, looking at the advertisements in it, it's this big book, and there's these carriages, and I thought, man, look at the way they're displayed, I and mean, they just look so, 
you know, I want one of those. <laughs> it's really, that's a weird thing. And it's just a beautiful machine. And then I started thinking about the word carriage, and it means, you know, you know how you convey. You're, it's not just this object, it's how you present. You know, it's your carriage. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, well that's interesting. So I could, I could contextualize that as an object, or I could have it as a descriptor. Oh, that's kind of neat. So then I, uh, then I did this drawing, and um, this was just a straight, like I didn't really know what I was doing here. So I've got the, the, the word, I've got the definition, the act of conveyance, and then I have this object which is not carriage, it's an object instead, and then here I've got all the binary, which means all of this, but it, again, it's just another reference to that, and none of it really refers to the right thing. Somehow, it's like a, a logic puzzle to me in my head. It doesn't really make sense, which I, I like. <laughs> and, and then this is a painting that I did. And um, then here's where the number comes in. So this is the total value of the word carriage in uppercase. And I just wanted to paint the carriage because I thought it was a really beautiful object. So I thought, oh, well, what other beautiful objects are there? And so then I started thinking, oh, let's, let's pick objects that are really beautiful, and the word means something that is about communication, that is about kind of <clears throat> steering people, getting them to see your point of view, uh, to, to buy into the value of whatever you're selling. That sounds really cynical, but I, I do, you know, I'm doing it right now, right? <laughs> yeah. So here's the telegraph to give nonverbal signals to another. So it's the object, but it's the action. And I really like this diagrammatic thing. And then I got, then I decided, well, oh, I'm going to do something more, more like a low relief. You know? And these are all done in graphite powder on a surface. I just kind of cover it in just soupy oily graphite and then just start wiping out and scratching in and drawing back into it. So it's, it's all just graphite on, on canvas. Uh, and what's the scale? Um, that is a little smaller than it really is. Mm -hmm. But not much. But these are kind of easel size paintings, I'd say. Dirigible is, about, is the biggest one of all of these. And convertible was one of the last ones I did. This is my this is my non to agree because I really love I really love this car and I really wanted to paint this car. But it's also kind of the luxury symbol, you know, if you drive one of these cars. But at the time it was like if you had one of these, man, you were somebody. Now you're somebody completely different if you drive one of these. <laughs> I want one of these so bad. last one I did. And this one has two, uh, it has two definitions because I really wanted it to be both. I was thinking about our economy uh, and what a dismal failure and also it, it all depends on who you're talking to. You know, they say, you know, say oh, it's, it's a dismal failure. Oh no, it, it, the economy's getting better. It's an astounding success. You know, so it, but it's still the bomb. Either way, it's still, it's still awful. Okay, then this is getting into the newer work, and uh, I, um, I let me just go to the slide, I'm not sure where I want to start here. Oh, okay, all right. So I was thinking about audio. How can I do this with audio and get away from text? And uh, I had this mockingbird that drove me insane, and he would, he would, he would sit outside and his song was like an hour and a half long. <laughs> And he had, there was this red bud, this red tip, right outside my window, and he would just go on and on and on. And when he would get to doing the car arms, oh, man, this was crazy. And I recorded it and did all kinds of stuff with it. And, and then I forgot about it. And then when I started thinking about wanting to handle animal song again, I remember that bird, and then I also had heard this Diane Reem show, and she had this ornithology song. She was saying, oh, all these, long, there's this, uh, there was this mockingbird that was speaking some vanished Native American language and because uh, they pass it down from father to son all through the bird line and so they, uh, that's literally, it's like the only knowledge we have. But he's not really speaking the language, he's just speaking the, the, the words, but you could hear what it sounded like. So I thought, well that's really, that, so he's saying something but he doesn't know what it means and he's not really communicating anything but he's getting the words right. 
I thought, well, that's that's interesting. So that uh, so that was actually the bird song from that mockingbird that drove me crazy. <laughs> and then I did cicadas because I I like cicadas and. And I was thinking about the noise, but then I realized after I did this one that the noise doesn't really how to communicate. It's the vibration that communicates because they sit on their little sticks. You know, I have to research everything. You know, and I didn't know anything about cicadas. So they sit on their sticks and they've got big drums, their whole bodies, and they beat their wings and they produce a particular kind of vibration that then travels up and down the leaves of vegetation that they're in. And that's what calls them mates. So you notice that they're never in the air making noise. They're always down because they're making vibration. So then I thought, well, this whole project is screwed. I should stop because <laughs> ants, insects get really difficult. And then I thought, well, I'm going to do ants, but then they do pheromones. All right, I'm not even going to try to figure that one out. Uh, but then I couldn't help myself and I did a whale because uh, I got interested in fluke design. And I found out that the fluke, that, that, you know, when, the, when the whale goes down and his little tail comes out, that's the fluke. And each one of these is completely different and unique to each whale. And there's this big worldwide database where people photograph them and they track where the whales are being sighted all throughout the world. And I thought, oh my God, that is fascinating. So uh, I started thinking about geographic, sh uh, geographic location and how these uh, the animals that I did before, the cicadas and the mockingbirds and the whales, are all migratory. I'm like, oh, I didn't even think of that. I'm kind of migratory. I'm a military brat, so I've traveled everywhere. And I thought, oh, I, I'm kind of liking the idea of identity and location and what you're saying. So here's the song for this particular whale on this particular date, at this particular latitude and longitude on this floating platform, which has a name, and it's right off the coast of Maui. And I thought, well, that's really great. So then I uh, started thinking about memory. And this is coming into the, the show that I've got, I'm working on right now called Here and Now. And so now what I'm thinking about is how an experience can be existing in my individual, my individual memory and in my, in my individual sense of space, like it happened to me at this particular time, this particular place, but it can also happen for you at a different time. So for instance, this is, um, this is, um, Neil Armstrong, this is my very first childhood memory, and uh, of laying on this Wakani rug with my dad, and we had our little arms up, and like, you know, I was like, oh, watching the TV, and hearing Neil Armstrong say, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, you know, and this is what it is. So I plotted that out, and then I put the date, and the universal time, because there's different time out in space, I didn't know that either, Apollo 11, Sea of Tranquility. I wasn't there, but I was there. And so was everybody in here, because it becomes part of the cultural narrative. The sound bite gets used over and over and over again. You re-experience this moment, this cultural story, over and over. It becomes part of who you are as, as an individual. Yeah, I remember my dad, it was a great memory, but it's also, you know, kind of nationalistic pride, or human beings go out to the world. I mean, you nail whatever you want. So I thought, well, this is really great. So I decided to do more work with sound bites. And uh, let me just see what I've got next, because I'm not, oh, this is the detail of that. So these are all done without, a, without, I didn't want any brush mark at all in these. So these are all like squeegee gone with a little rubber tool, so that there's no brush work in this at all. It's just encrusted paint, just kind of spatula it on, kind of, so to speak. So I didn't want to see any mark except for the sound, except for the one or the zero, and that's, and that's it. And there are others of those that, I, if you are interested in seeing more, I've got three others and they're all underway, but none of them were fit to be shown. Um, and that's going to be the Arts Council in early December. Uh, and then these are some ideas I was working with prior to going to Vermont. And I just came back from Vermont Studio Center, was there for a month, and got to explore all of these things. So I was thinking about data structures just before I left, I finished a couple paintings on this idea of saying, okay, what if I just take the data and all the information I'm working with, just put over here, and just look at the stuff that we designed to hold the data, the, the, the data structures. So you've got like, oh, I wrote down a whole bunch of things. I mean, this is a programming 
this term is a programming term, so it refers to lists, stacks, queues, trees, heaps. You know, if you've been in programming, this all sounds like, oh yeah, yeah, it's 101. Um, so let me just show you the first one, I, the first couple I did. Oh, here's a picture of me. At the Vermont Studio Center, so here's one of my here and now pieces I'm working on now. This looks totally different now. And this is one of my structural pieces, the data structures, which I think I've got another I'm going to show you. And this is the final piece I'm going to show you uh, in the series. But I kind of wanted to show you how what the space looks like. I don't know if you've ever been to residency here before or anything, but this is a dreamy yes. thing. Dreamy <laughs> thing to do. And I don't know why it took so long to do it. It is a fa fantastic thing to do for yourself. Uh, so here's the first data structure paintings. These are parking lots. And uh, this, they hang, they're hanging in the second floor of building two at Golden Bell. So there's this long hallway, and I'm going to be filling it up with data structure paintings over the next however long it takes me. Here's another view of these two. And then I ran across cemetery designs. Oh my god, cemeteries are so beautiful. <coughs> They're so round, and uh, you know these parking spaces are eternal. So <laughs> you know you don't need to go out of these. You go in and out. You just go in, and that's it. So they're they're beautiful ones, and I found all these websites. Like there's one called Find a Grave. It's so ghoulish, but people go out and they take they make diagrams, and then they upload them. They scan them, and upload them, so you can find any any grave site you want, and they'll tell you who's in what grave. So here's the first one that I'm working on now, and it's got the, the grave slot, the numbers. And I kind of think of that, well, Anna and I were kind of arguing about that. Should it have the numbers or should it not have the numbers? And I think it should have the numbers, because it's like a place, of, it's like a storage address, like an index number in, in a computer system in memory. So I'm leaving it. <laughs> That's my reason. I'm leaving it. And then this is the latest work, and, and this is the very last, and the only thing, and it's actually the most exciting thing for me right now, is this new work, because it's kind of bringing together all these things I've been talking about. So I was thinking, uh, remember back to Fluke, how a shape can have a specific amount of information, and like a fingerprint, right? This is only me right here. Um, and think about how, um, uh, what, what else was I, I kind of can't, I'm like losing it now. Oh, so there's a, there's this guy named Eric Domain and he makes, uh, he does all this theory, origami theory at MIT. And he won this MacArthur thing and I've been watching his little videos online. And so I'm really kind of interested in geometric folding patterns and the theory behind that and how you can, theoretically, you could make a shape, now think, think about fluke too. So here I'm thinking, well, what if I took a data set, so I, I arrived at all of my data points, and then used geometric folding algorithms to make sure that I could then theoretically create this foldable three-dimensional object in two dimensions. So I'm making sculpture, but I'm not making sculpture which is great because it's kind of like that I'm a representational artist even though I work abstractly, which really works for me. So this piece uh, is called How to Fold My Heart and it's about 80 inches long, about 55 tall. And if you envision this outer shape here as the paper, the single, the single sheet of foldable material, if you will, uh, and then you see these points here defined by this shape that I've kind of there's a different coloration. So there's points like right in here, like I'm kind of pointing them out to you. Here, 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 here. So I took seven people in my life that are really important, like my wife and my parents and my best friends. And I said, I laid a, a map out of the United States and I said, okay, where were they born? Put down a point. Where do they live now? Put down another point. And then, so I ended up with this bunch of points in geographic relationship to each other. That's important. And then I made the diagram, constructed the lines so that this shape could actually be folded. Theoretically, you could then fold it according to the mountain and valley folding pattern that is existing in this. So the, so the next step is to actually make these things really big. I actually think I'd like to see them as sculpture, you know, large sculpture and fold them out of 
some sort of material. I'm not really sure what, but this is where I am right now. And that is it. <laughs> Don't want to know, and then they and then they should leave, you know. And I'm, well, you 
you know, I'd like somebody to, to think that maybe there's a little bit more. I mean, I like to ask of my of artists that I know, I like to know that there's more. You know, I don't want it to be just a simple, um, a decorative experience. You know, I, I like work that way, but I don't like it long term. I really want something to be there. Mm -hmm. Something that will keep me interested and, it, and I, so I don't get bored. You know? mm -hmm. so. And I thought about doing more things, like maybe working more collaboratively with other people. Uh, but the, everything gets quickly turned into like uh, installation work or video stuff, and then it's going digital. And I don't want to go digital. I want to be digital, but be analog about the way I'm digital. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so you did, you had, the other night I saw you on, uh, you had a, in your oh, studio. my live feed. Yes, I have a live feed. So you do actually share some of this. I do. I do. I occasionally forget that that thing is on. Yeah, so you, if you are interested in watching me paint and, and occasionally other artists coming in and ranting about a variety of things, then you can, you can go to my website and there's a link that says broadcast on it. And if you click on that and I'm live, you'll see me doing whatever I'm doing. Uh, if not, you'll just see a still image. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And if you friend me on Facebook, you can get you'll That's get right, the seven. Yeah. yeah. How did you? Uh, how do you decide for the initial pieces we saw? Um, how did you decide on the texts? Uh, I, it was fairly arbitrary. I went online and I found all kinds of you know. I, I typed in top one hundred world literature. You know, so I decided right there I was going to do fiction. And uh, of course, the lists are all terribly biased for English speakers. And there's not much I can do with ASCII the way it is right now, because it's very English biased too. But then I, the list I got was 100 writers giving 100 top hits of their top favorites. So I figured, well, the writers probably know. So I trust the 100 writers to give me 100 good things. And I haven't actually read them all. Did you feel disappointed when you got to the end of the paragraph? Like, you know, you had spent so much time with those particular words in terms of like letting it stop right there? No, not really. <laughs> I get really tired of, I get really right. tired of doing them. I, and I, every time I do one, I say, this is the last one. I am never going to do another one of these. <laughs> and then I think, oh, it'd be great to do Canterbury's Tales, which is the one I'm looking at now. And I don't know why it would be great to do Canterbury's Tales, but I feel drawn to it. Like, I need to do. But it's almost the first 500 characters. Yeah. Never anything out of the middle. No, no. And I always do read that part. You know, some openers are just great. Mm -hmm. And then others just kind of drag on. I'm like, man, you're really not. You're losing me here. And it's just one paragraph. It's amazing how different each one is. Great. Good <laughs>
if you've seen these upstairs, if you are interested in the artwork around the house, there's a dozen copies of this upstairs, and it has every piece of art in the house, who the artist is, medium, etc. If that's of interest, this is the geek sheet. Um, we had a, a, we're also trying to have the various universities, and to a lesser extent, the, the, younger, the younger students come and visit us here at Castle House. The whole sort of point of this place is to engage the art community in the area. So, um, Ellen O'Hara Slavic, who is on the faculty at UNC, brought her curating class over just a few days ago, and they have a show that just went out Friday night called Don't Be Intimidated by This Painting. Um, it is at the Friday Center, and the Friday Center, it's a new thing for the Friday Center to be showing art, um, and they're excited about it. So, And the show is of the MFA students at Carolina. Um, so, a lot of, and it's a really interesting show. Uh, uh, Ellen and I went to the opening. So there's a couple cards out there if you want to. The show is up until um, uh, uh, through December 4th. So check that out. Um, our friends Leon and Ariel, the, the, the chocolate gurus back there in the back, are making fabulous um, specialty chocolates. And they've brought some this evening for you to enjoy. But, they are also a new and fabulous enterprise here. Um, a couple other um, program-related things. Uh, Dan Gottlieb, um, a good friend and artist, is um, going to be doing a show here in February of 2012. Um, really wonderful photographic work. So if you are on the Castle House list, you will find out about it. If you're not on the Castle House list and would like, to be on the Castle House list, please leave me your email. Um, all things that go on here um, go out on little invitations, and that's how most of you are here. MJ Sharp, um, dear friend of Castle House, um, the first um, major exhibition we had here called the Super Yummy Show. Um, <laughs> Um, and I'm working with MJ right now on a show that will open at Craven Allen Gallery in Durham on December 3rd of phenomenal um, uh, long exposure, large format um, color photographs that are really extraordinary. Um, what else do we have in our... You must try the cheese back there. <laughs> uh, From Reliable Cheese. Reliable Cheese. Durham has its own Ruby high-end cheese shop now next to Rue Claire. And I've never tasted cheese that good in my life, so um, try that out. Um, any other things you can think of coming up? Um, okay, so please feel free to... We'll have a new crop of artists starting in... Late March, early April, we have a wonderful artist by the name of Mame Kratz coming from Arizona. And Mame, this is one of her really small pieces, she casts natural materials into glass and resin. I can pass this around, but she's going to be here with us. Wait a minute. <laughs> um, we have a fabulous photographer by the name of Debbie Luster. Uh, he's coming to be with us. Um, a French photographer whom we brought to Durham in 2006, Georges Roos, is coming back to reprise his, his um, project. At least we hope he is. <laughs> and um, I'm blanking on Anyway, you have to have some surprises. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we run the residency six months of the year, typically from um, March to late August, and then from September to March, we have a paying tenant um, who happens to be away for the weekend, which is why you can see their space, um, to pay for the other six months of, uh, of the residency. So if there are any questions for us, um, we're happy to field them. Again, thank you, Heather, for a lovely talk. Thank you.